Good evening, everybody. My name is Todd Scholl. I am the lead learner at the South Carolina Education Association's Center for Educator Wellness and Learning. We call ourselves COOL. You can find out more about us at COOL.us. That's www.COOL.us. I hope everybody's doing well tonight. It has been like a couple of crazy weeks here in South Carolina in public education. So many things that are happening and um, a lot that's on people's radars right now. Um, I hope that you're going to find some time this week to rest, recharge, because we certainly have a lot to address in public schools uh, moving forward as we close out 2022 and begin 2023. And we're going to need to be well rested and recharged and renewed as we uh, look towards some of these battles that we're going to be facing, um, whether it's the stuff down in Berkeley or uh, book bannings. Um, and the upcoming administration, some of the things that they may try to do. And the key is going to be for us to come together collectively to use our voice and stand up for our public schools. As always, we would love to connect with you at the SCEA. If you are watching and you are not currently a member, head on over to the SCEA.org slash connect. Um, and of course, at the bottom, you can see how you can join us if you'd like to join our movement Go to join the SEA.org or text the word join to 48744. So welcome to tonight's live stream. Um, I am excited. So some of you know that um, I used to work at SARA. SARA in South Carolina stands for the Center for Educator Recruitment, Retention, and Advancement. It was my honor to do work there. I did communications, um, technology, and program development work at SARA. I got to work with all of the programs from Pro Team to Teacher Cadets. Uh, to teaching fellows, to our mentoring programs, to our teacher leadership programs. And uh, one of the per people that I got to meet there was Dr. Jennifer Garrett. And uh, Dr. Jennifer Garrett is responsible for doing uh, research um, and uh, program evaluation at Sarah. Uh, she's a brilliant mind. And she also, one of the things that she does that people know her well for is she is the author each year of the South Carolina Educator Supply and Demand Report. And that report is probably one of the most widely known things that Sarah does each year. And one of the reasons is because of the effectiveness of the data that she collects. She spends a lot of time and effort collecting data from our public school districts each year. And then she spends a lot of time compiling that data into a report to help um, the state understand what is the state of educator supply and demand. So like how many uh, educator, educator departures are there, how many people are coming into the profession, how many vacant classrooms are, are there. And of course, every year um, that data is released around this time and people take a look at it and it's sort of like, you know, taking the temperature of the state of public education in South Carolina. And uh, that report by Sierra just came out uh, Thursday of last week. It was released publicly. And, um, and fortunately, um, Dr. Garrett ag agreed to come on the show tonight. So I, without further ado, I'm going to bring on Jennifer. Jennifer, how are you? Good, Todd. How are you? I'm doing really well. I'm doing, I'm doing really well. And good. it's always good to see you. Um, yeah. you know, I miss all my colleagues at Sierra. Mm -hmm. It's such a special time uh, in my career to be there and, and do that work. And of course, you know, you and I became friends and um, I just appreciate you know, everything that you, all that you do, um, I think your role is one of those roles that you're not necessarily out in front, um, but you're, what you do is so important because it supports all of the work that is all the important work that's happening at Sarah. So um, I think you deserve a little bit of a shout out here tonight. Uh, <laughs> Thank for everything. you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so so did, I, I, I think I kind of like give a brief summary there of what the supply and demand report is. Can you kind of uh, go into a little more detail about the, the, the data that you collect, how you collect it, and then kind of how you piece it all together and what your thought process is as you, as you, as you put this information out for the public. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, so this is a survey that's been going out to all the public school districts in South Carolina since 2001. Um, I came to Sarah in 2008, so I can't I can't really speak for the, the surveys that happened before I got there, but I took over in 2008. So I've been doing it for, for a good bit. And it's sort of morphed over the years, you know, depending on, you know, changing needs of the state or just general changes in public education. Um, we've added some questions. We've taken away some questions, but mostly it, it 
we asked districts about what is going on in terms of recruitment and retention, you know, that, that supply and demand. So how many teachers are they're hiring? How many teachers are leaving? Um, how many vacancies they have at the beginning of each school year? So the survey goes out to them typically, um, typically September 1st. Now it's been, you know, it's kind of, it's been before that, it's been after that. It, it just depends on the year. Obviously COVID, you know, threw it all over the place. So, um, but usually they have about a month to fill it out, uh, to complete it and get it back to me. And so this year they had the month of September because um, I do want to give them the first two weeks of the school year to just sort of, you know, catch their breath. And, and when I say they, uh, personnel directors are typically the ones who, who fill, who complete the survey for me. Um, they get it back to me. It's an Excel format and it's in, extremely comprehensive. It, it takes a lot of them that entire month to, to gather that information. And so then I take all of the survey data, compile it, try to make sense of it. Um, and, then, and then we release a report typically this time you know every year it's i mean it's been as late as january in the past december and then but we just realized how important this information is so we it is absolutely a priority and you know many months of my life every year which um, I'm, I'm happy to do because it is such a you know such an important topic right you know it's it's interesting over um i i you know i've, I've seen a lot of people including myself will um go on to district um HR pages and count up the number of job postings and try to sort of get a feel for where we're headed, um, which is a really sort of in a very, very informal process. Um, I think it's important for people to know that what you do is, is, a, is a much more formal process. And as, and as much as that may kind of help us kind of take the temperature, what you're doing is digging in really deeply to ensure that these numbers are, are highly accurate and reliable because we know that a lot of policy decisions may be made um, on them. Can you talk about the differences between counting up maybe what might people might see on a public uh, sure. website and then what you do? Yes. Um, so anyone can go to, a like you said, an HR website and, and check out their vacancies. The problem with that is they're not always um, kept up to date by a lot of districts. Um, it, you know, vacancies can be posted, but they've already been filled or they are no longer vacancies. They're not even trying to fill that that particular position in a district, but they don't remove it from the website. It's not in real time a lot of times. So um, so that's really not the most accurate way to go about it. Um, I know some do and, and they're just trying to get sort of a gauge, you know, a sense of what's going on. But it's, it's they're, they're typically not up to date. Um, a lot of them are not. So I, you know, I go directly to the districts. I have contacts in each district. And again, it's usually a personnel director or HR director, whatever terminology they use. Um, and they, you know, they expect the survey every year. A lot of them even sort of base their data collection uh, instruments, uh, databases, things like that, they will base it off of the supply and demand survey because they know it's coming. It helps them sort of, you know, keep everything in track or on track. And, um, you know, it just, it's, it makes things easier for them too. Um, and, and for me as well, because they're able to get it back to me quicker. Um, but yeah, I, I feel very good, very confident about the data. I mean, yes, it's self-reported and there's always some, you know, room for error there. You know, it's, 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 humans reporting data to another human. I mean, a lot of things can happen, but um, a lot of these folks have, you know, been doing this a long time and they're, they're experts. And um, I'm just so appreciative for them for doing it because it is, I talk about it taking months out of my life. It, it takes a lot of time for them, especially those larger districts to gather all of that information when you're trying to account for, you know, 300 teachers who've left your district and and telling me you know how many years of experience they have and if they went to another district if they retired i mean that's it's a lot of work no matter how sophisticated your system is yeah for sure mm -hmm. let's take a look because you know when i saw the report last week my eyes just went you know open <laughs> pretty wide um you know we it, it's not shocking I mean, to me, the the what I'm seeing is kind of what I expected, and yet still those numbers are pretty alarming. Pretty, um, I mean, I asked you, I think I as this this has got to be like a record, right? Let's talk about some of the let's talk about some of the key points of data from this year's report, so that folks watching uh, can get a feel for what we're talking about here. Sure, sure. Do you want to pull up the, the yeah. screen? Yep. Yeah. Awesome. There you go. 
Fantastic. I don't want to be able to see it. Okay, good deal. Um, yeah, so for anyone who has seen our report in the past, um, it this year's looks very different. In fact, we're we're really referring, I know it says report right there in the title, but we're really referring more to it as, as like a white paper or, you know, just it's, it's a two page document that really just hits those highlights of of what, you know, what the data are saying. And we just felt like, you know, graphics and bullets and, um, you know, more visuals were just just better. It was a better way to share it with with people and they were more likely to read it. And hopefully it will grab their eyes, grab their attention. Again, we're just we're just here to share data. I mean, that that is Sarah's role, you know, especially when it comes to this supply and demand report. And so we thought, you know, why not? Why not make it look different? So that that's exactly what we did. Um, and so we highlighted the most important pieces of data. You'll see that that teacher vacancy data um, is the very first one we put um, that we put on the white paper because I think that's probably what most most people are interested in. How many positions are still vacant, you know, at the time they complete the survey? And again, it's usually the month of September. So, you know, September it could be you know two years after they start school. It, it could be a, a full month, and they've um, they tell us how many vacancies that that they have that they are still actively trying to fill. And you'll see here that there was a thirty nine percent increase compared to last year. Um, and that's even with um, even with fewer positions reported overall. So we, you know, we ask about total positions as well, not not vacancies, but hey, how many how many sort of allocated positions do you have that are that are filled right now? And so that number actually went down from last year while while the number of unfilled positions uh, rose 30, 39 percent. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then teacher departures is probably the next uh, in, in terms of, you know, most frequently asked about vacancies and departures are really those those figures and those those data points that people want to know about. Um, and just for clarification, when we talk about teacher departures, we're talking about those certified educators from the previous year. So that would be the 2021-22 school year. Um, who did not return to a teaching or service position in the same district for the current school year. And so when I say teaching position, that is exactly what that is. That's that classroom, you know, classroom based teacher. When I say service position, that means one of four positions. It's um, it's a, a library, a school librarian, a school psychologist, a school counselor or a speech language pathologist. So when I refer to service positions or service fields, that those are the, the four groups of educators that I'm referring to. And we do that because that's the terminology that the State Department uses. And we, we, try, to, we try to maintain consistency with that. So we're all sort of speaking the same language. Yeah. Um, and here, I <clears throat> excuse me, I just have this, um, this data point that one in seven educators did not return to a teaching or service position in the same South Carolina public school district. So that means that they could be in another South Carolina district. And I have some some data on that on the next page. But so they could have stayed in the state for sure. A lot of them actually do. Typically, about 25 percent of departures end up going to another South Carolina public school district, which statewide, you know, for the state of South Carolina is not considered turnover or departure or you know, attrition, but but for that particular district, it, it's, you know, obviously it's still creating a vacancy. Um, and that's that's really what, you know, what the focus is here. Yeah. Um, Sherry, our, our, Sherry East, our president, asked if there's data that can be shared per district. Yes, I have data per district. Um, we typically just share this as a statewide report, um, but it, it certainly is public information and I'm, I'm happy to share it with her if, if, if Yes, if it would be. She could reach out to you, Garrett J at Sarah.org. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, so that next page, it looks like, yep, you're on there. That this was really a, also about teacher departures, but, you know, kind of breaking it down between those movers and leavers. So as I was saying before, some of them just move, you know, some of them move to another South Carolina district. Some of them actually stay in the same district, but they move into a uh, let's call it a, a non-teaching position or an administrator position. So that that is still technically considered considered turnover, considered a departure, because um, again, it does it does leave an unfilled an unfilled position. So you'll see there from the from the the chart with three years um, from starting at 2020 going up to 
to 23, um, there was a, a 16% jump from 2021 to 21, 22, and then a 20% jump um, from last year to this year. Mm. And retirement stayed about the same. It's usually about 17, 18%. Um, as I said earlier, about a quarter, um, 26% this time transferred to another South Carolina public school district. Um, 2% were dismissed involuntarily. And that's that's all we asked about this year. Um, that's That was a, a really big change in the survey. Traditionally, we would ask districts for reasons that teachers are leaving. Um, and we had just a, a, a menu, uh, a, a a pretty involved list of all the reasons that teachers could, you know, could be leaving a district. And what we found is that it, it, this really is not the, the most effective tool, um, data, data gathering tool to, to find out that information. You know, a lot of times, you know, this Todd, um, you know, teachers are, are a little reluctant, a lot reluctant to, you know, to, to tell a personnel director or a principal or, you know, someone from the district office why they're leaving. If it is in fact related to, you know, job dissatisfaction or, their administrator or school climate or, you know, all the reasons that we know that, you know, teachers are leaving, um, they're, they're, right. they're pretty hesitant to, to talk about that. So yeah. we just felt that we were not getting the, the most complete data we could when it came to departure reasons. So we, we actually just stopped ask, asking. And so all we asked for this year was um, the number who retired, the number who transferred to another district, and then the number who were dismissed involuntarily, because we thought no matter what their, exit system was or what they had in place for when teachers did indica indicate that they were leaving, that districts should be able to tell us those things. Sure. Um, yeah. And then um, the the other point that came out, the, the key point that came out that I was not surprised, but it, it, the, the percentage was, was pretty low, um, lower than I thought it would be. But we asked districts to tell us about their new hires. You know, are they new to the profession or are they just new to your district? You know, so do they have some experience? Where are they coming from? Um, and so for those who are brand new to the district or excuse me, brand new to the profession, we asked them, um, you know, what what um, program they came from? Was it an in-state teacher ed program, out of state? Um, alternative certification, things like that. And of all the new hires this year, only 17% were recent graduates of a South Carolina teacher ed program. Um, and that's down from 22% last year. And typically, you know, that ranges, I mean, that can range, you know, 22 up to 25% typically. I mean, it's it's been as, as much as, you know, 35, 36% in the past. So that tells us that the number of students who are graduating from these programs in South Carolina is is in fact decreasing, and we know that it is. I don't have the I don't have the most recent numbers. I I just asked for them I think last week, and so he's um, it's from the Commission on Higher Education, and they're they're working on it for me. So I'll have those numbers soon. But I suspect based on this data, these data, that those numbers are going to be lower. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think I think you know two of the key numbers that we always look at. We're looking at the number of vacant classrooms, which was four, over fourteen hundred, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's up. And that's up. Was that up thirty nine percent from last year? Vacancies, yes, thirty nine percent. Vacant, mm -hmm. yeah, vacancies. Which is, I mean, when you stop and you really think about what does that mean on the ground, you've got imagine across the state of South Carolina, need people to imagine there's fourteen hundred classrooms that don't have a teacher and you think about let's just say that's 20 kids per class you're looking at 28 that 20 to 30,000 kids uh, uh you know without without a teacher i mean that's it's um a, a very very alarming number and you told me that that shattered the record as far as you know that that the number of vacancies shattered a record as far as I know, since I've been doing this, um, last year's number of vacancies was actually the highest. And that was, got it right here, that was uh, 1,060, was 1,063. So, um, and now and we're it's at, we're at, at no. nearly 1,500. Yeah. Nearly 1,500. And then the departures, when you think about one in seven, one in seven teachers uh, leaving their position, um, it was over, it was 8,300, 80, what was it, was the number 8,000? Yes, it was 80, 8,300. Yep. 8,300. So, I mean, and that's the record as well, the number of departures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I, I, and, and I think people need to just pause for a moment and understand, uh, a, a point that you made 
before you started diving into the numbers, and that is that Sarah is not a political organization. Sarah is is really is a state funded organization designed to help the state recruit and re retain and advance. Um, public educators for public schools. Um, so therefore, you, when you collect this data, it's not done for political purposes, mm -hmm. and, and there's no real political thing that Sarah's trying to do. That's kind yeah. of the yes, SEEA's <laughs> role right. in these numbers, and then and then talking about policy and and talking about and advocating for certain things. So um, I want to make that really really clear that Sarah's done is always you know as you know, when I was on there, so I started working there 2011 through the whole time, um, really took that um, position very seriously in terms of not trying to utilize this position in, in, in a political way. You might want to talk about that a little bit more. No, I, I think you nailed it. It's, um, you know, it's, it, it is a, sometimes a tough position to be in. We just have to sort of ride that, you know, that fence um, very closely. Uh, because yeah. that is just, that's not our role. That's not, um, it's not a, a, a permission that, you know, that we have as, as Sarah employees. Um, and so we just have to present right. the information and support, you know, support public educators the, the best we can with our, through our programs and, you know, any kind of research and data that we can collect and, and put out there, you know, very, uh, in a very non-biased way, but, you know, again, numbers are numbers. So that's, right. Right. Sometimes, yeah, I mean, they, sometimes the they speak for themselves, right? <laughs> you go to the doctor and your cholesterol is 300. You know, it's not, there's no political thing there. It's just, <laughs> we, we, we've got a high cholesterol. We may right. want to do something right. about that. Yeah, you know, we may want to look at that, but we may want to look at that number and not, not dismiss it, but look at it in terms of, okay, doctor, what do we do now? And, and that's what I would say is, um, you being on here doesn't mean you advocate, you know, that Sarah is in any way aligning themselves with the SCEA's policies on this. We're just really trying to inform our members uh, in greater detail the work that you're, the great work that Sarah does. We just want our, our members, including our president, who's uh, tuning, tuning in and very intrigued um, by these numbers, um, just l allowing our members to, to, to have those numbers so that we can then, our, our job at the SCEA is to advocate for teachers and to start to say, well, for us to dig into like why, we, we know why educators are leaving. I mean, we're, we're talking to educators all of the time. We know um, it has, a, it's a combination of a lot of things, including uh, wages and then n knowing that you can go get another job in this economy and make just as much money with per perhaps significantly less stress um, and perhaps more autonomy. Uh, we also know that the working conditions, you know, I've, I was in schools, I've been in schools a lot over the past month and seeing teachers who uh, have to get to school by seven o'clock and then don't have a break, including at lunch. And a lot of people don't, aren't aware of that, that a lot of South Carolina educators don't even have the capacity to go to lunch without ba basically being on duty and sitting with their students and monitoring their students and they're trying to eat with their students so they don't get a break throughout the entire day. So it's it's a combination of wages and working conditions, a lack of respect that they're sensing in, in, in a multitude of ways. Um, Sherry um, asked a question. She mentioned that um, there, there were 400 international teachers that were used to plug in, and that was was that a record number, as far as you know, the the number of international teachers that were hired. Again, it is yes, as far as as far as I know, as far as I can go back and look, um, it it is a record number. Um, now it you know it jumped from four percent to six percent, four percent meaning uh, of the total number hired, four percent were considered international teachers, and right. you know we don't um, designate like type of program. We just say, you know, international visiting teacher, and that's how districts report them. So yeah, it went from 4% last year to 6% this year. And do you, I sure you want to know, I don't, I don't know if you have this information, what it would cost, does it, what it costs us to bring international teachers to South Carolina? You know? I actually don't know. I know it's fairly expensive. And I know that because, um, you know, Sarah sort of manages the rural recruitment initiative. Um, I guess manages the right word. Uh, we manage the funds, you know, and, and we're responsible for getting the funds to the districts that are eligible for this initiative. And it's all based on turnover um, and requesting money for international teachers is is happens very frequently from these districts. Um, and it is it 
it consumes a lot of the money that that they do get through this um, through this initiative, which is improviso. So um, I don't have a dollar amount. I could certainly get it, but I, I do know it is not it's not inexpensive. Yeah, and I, I and, and I think Sherry and I are on the same page with the idea that we are very much support the idea of international exchange and the idea of bringing in uh, diverse groups of teachers and, and exchanging, having a true ex cultural exchange yeah. is something that we would support. What I think we're concerned about is that when we're getting up to 6% of new hires being international teachers, is it really cultural exchange or is it, or is it just our inability to recruit people into the profession because we're not paying them enough and we're not providing them with great working conditions that we're having to use these these kind of quote unquote band-aid uh, approaches um, that can maybe temporarily fill those vacant classrooms but aren't really long-term solutions in terms of building up um, our teaching core um, and I know I don't know you may probably can't can't comment on that but I mean I mean we're, what we're seeing are trends right we the, these trends are not things that are just new for this year. We are seeing the number of vacant classrooms has has been pretty consistently moving, um, has uh, increasing over the, the course of many years. Same with the number of departures, same with the number of international teachers we're having to hire. So it's not, people need to understand that a vacant classroom, um, the number of vacant classrooms when you see 1400, yes, that's vacant classrooms. But how many classrooms are we are we having to plug in somebody who maybe doesn't have the experience or the credentials, but we're just putting them in in, in place because we don't have anybody else? It's kind of like that. What I what I liken it to, it, and I think this is easy for folks to understand, is if you're if you're Shane Beamer or Dabo Swinney and you've got openings in your football program, you're trying to go out and get four and five star players because that's what you need to to win championships. But if you just looked at it as we, we literally have positions where we can't find players <laughs> and and we're having to go and, you know, just pick out any kid from high school. Hey, have you played high school football? OK, great. So you're you're on the team. And, and that's just not a way to build a winning football program. And I think South Carolina has to look at how, how are we going to build a winning public education system if we can't recruit top notch teachers and we're having to kind of you know, scrape and and scramble and look, you know, shake the tree and try to find just anybody, any warm body to fill these um, these positions. And it's not it's not anything against. Obviously, we have amazing educators. You know, we saw them at Sarah's teacher forum conference. We've got amazing, amazing people leading classrooms. But when you've got still have over fourteen hundred vacant classrooms and over eight thousand leaving each year. This is this is a number that should be causing our state leaders to really reflect on what's going on. Like, why can't we why can't we recruit and retain our teachers? What's going on? And it seems to me there's obvious answers to that. But it feels like um, instead of addressing the problem in many ways, the they're either ignoring it or exacerbating the um the, the problem and I think this is what's causing a lot of frustration and we have I, I fear you know we've been ignoring this problem and we've been seeing it increase and I'm just going to ask you to confirm we've seen a steady increase for a long period of time now in departures and vacancies correct correct okay so if we're seeing if we're seeing that that's it's not a new problem that should be surprising state leaders and I think anybody who is in our field could have said the numbers are going to be worse this year Wait, watch, watch when, when Sarah releases the report, they're going to be worse. This year. I think everybody knew that it would be like because it would be like my cholesterol numbers last year were 250 and I've done nothing but eat bacon all year. You know, I mean, like your your numbers aren't going to be better. They're probably going to be worse when you go get them screened. So like this is just to me some common sense. And if we do, don't if we don't, I think our state leaders just can no longer ignore this problem because if they care about putting students first, then what they should be caring about is recruiting the best and retaining the best educators. And it doesn't feel like they're doing much um, to, to, to make that happen. It doesn't really feel like they're putting a lot of effort into it. Shifting gears, though, because I know you, you can't really 
comment on that. But um, is if a district combined classes because they couldn't fill the position, was that reported as a vacancy? It depends. It, 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 that's a great question, and it depends. So if they are still actively looking for a teacher to fill that position, then they are instructed to, to report it to me as a vacancy. If that's their solution and they're okay with the, the larger class size and they are no longer trying to fill that position, then they would not report it as a vacancy. Okay, and then Sherry asks, is a vacancy only reported as a position being advertised? Um, I don't think so. I, I don't, I don't, we don't talk about when I send out the survey to these personnel directors, we, I don't talk about, you know, advertising or what, at what positions you have listed or anything like that. I just, I ask them very, hopefully straightforward in a straightforward manner, um, how many positions that they have that are current teaching and service positions that are currently vacant. Um, and then when they come back to me, if I see something that, you know, let's say they have way more than they did the year before or way less than they did before, I will typically follow up and say, hey, I just want to make sure this is correct. Um, and, you know, they'll say, yes, it is. Or they'll say, oh, my gosh, that's a mistake. I'm so sorry. Let me resubmit the survey. Uh, right. That happens often as well. Uh, but I do I do confirm with them that I, I just want to ensure that these are positions that you are actively trying to fill. Um, so I, I feel good about the numbers we're getting. Could there be some underreporting? I know. Yeah. So, yeah, I see the comment there. Um, could that be happening? I mean, I, yes, it could. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. it surely could. Yeah. Can't confirm it, but it, I mean, it's, it's again, it's self-reported data and, you know, they're, they're interpreting, you know, yeah. a vacancy how they want to. So. Yeah. And one of the things that people need to understand from a structural standpoint when it comes to public schools is the more of these vacancies you have, the more pressure you're putting on the classroom teacher. And here's why, uh, folks who may not understand how this works. If, if I've got more vacancies in my school and now I'm having to take some of the kids that would have gone into that vacant classroom and add them to a teacher's classroom, now that teacher, the average class size may go from 24 to 28 or something like that. Or we're struggling to even find substitutes who can come in so that if, if the person next to me down the hall misses a day, we can't find a sub. Now we've got to know, we've got to find where are those kids going to go because they're gonna, still going to show up to school. So then we have to either put them in another teacher's class or have, take away your planning and, and put you in there uh, to cover those classes during your planning. And this is putting additional pressures um, on educators who are already under a lot of stress and strain. And so what's happening is to me, like there's this cracking and crumbling of the whole system because for every teacher that quits and leaves, you know, and, and we struggle to find substitutes and struggle to find p replacements, you're putting more strain and stress on the classroom teachers who are there who then are like already maybe thinking about quitting. And, and you can see how it's almost like a snowball effect in terms of just putting more strain on the system, more stress on the system. And without a real concerted effort by state leaders to take that strain off by making teaching a more uh, enticing career, I, I, I fear that that's, that, that strain is going to reach, a, it, it already has re, re, reached a breaking point, but we're gonna, we could see next year's numbers really explode in terms of the number of people leaving. And this has such profound impacts on our kids People need to understand that the, the, the people affected most by this are, are not just the educators, but the students who are missing out on have, being led by somebody in, in, a, in a classroom that's now vacant or being put into a class with higher numbers or in the classroom with an educator who's now getting burned out because they're being overworked, underpaid and exploited um, because of the way the system is, um, is operating and failing to meet their needs. So. Um, I see Sherry has another thing. She says, that's, that's what I'm hearing, how districts have dealt with vacancies where they are paying the high school teachers to cover their planning. And that is what's happening. It's very difficult, though, uh, for those who've never taught to get up early in the morning and to go and teach 
all day long without a break. I don't think people understand the the toll that that takes on a person because there's so there's a lot of work that has to be done when you're not teaching. So if you're teaching all day, you still have grading, you still have planning, you still have you know preparing materials, making copies, doing all the things that you need to do to prepare for the next day. And that if that can't be done during the school day, now you're now you're there till five, six, seven o'clock trying to get all that done and you know rinse and repeat that day after day. And it's really not a sustainable uh, work environment for, for most people. Um, so one of the things that you, ha you have looked at in the past is as we recruit young people, the number of people completing teacher ed programs, is that a number that you still investigate? And if not, why? And if, and or so what's your sense of the number of young people kind of coming into the profession through a more traditional pipeline? Um, yeah, so I, I alluded to that a little earlier that I suspect those numbers, you know, they, they've, they've been sort of on a pretty steady decline over the past, right. let's call it five years. I don't have it in front of me right now. Um, and I don't have the most recent numbers. I've requested them. And so I, they'll, I think I'll probably have them by the end of the month. It, okay. it does come from the Commission on Higher Education, and they're, they're always very, um, very cooperative in, in terms of, of sharing data with us. So that's that's really good. Um, based on the percentage I talked about earlier, that only 17% of all of our, how many, um, over 8,000 new hires, 17% were recent graduates of, of right. South Carolina teacher ed programs. And that's the lowest that it's by far that it's ever been. Um, so again, just based on that, I'm guessing that those numbers are even lower, that the number of graduates is even lower this year. Right. So, so you had seen, we have seen statistically over the course of many years, mm -hmm. fewer people going through a traditional teacher ed program. And for yes. those who aren't familiar with what that means, it means like going to college and becoming a teacher and like getting a four year or five year degree to become a, a teacher. Fewer yes. and fewer people doing that route and more and more people leaving the profession or, or departing from the classroom while that's happening. So both numbers heading in the wrong, in, in the wrong direction. Right. So the re recruitment right. and retention, <laughs> both yeah. heading, heading in the wrong direction, which is, which is what's creating this crisis of vacant classrooms because you just don't have enough people. And the, and, and again, the problem isn't just that, but it's also who, who is filling those vacancies. We need to be asking, it's not just, it's cause it's not just about like, you know, Shane Beamer doesn't just fill an offensive line position. You know, it's it's who are you filling that with? Is that a person who's going to be able to lead young people in a way that's that that you know drives them to success, or is it going to be just a a person that you just found who was willing to do the job? And um, it, it's very alarming. Uh, and, and I think a lot of districts, unfortunately, and I I'm, I can say this because I, I, I hear it from them very often. A lot of the personnel directors, unfortunately, they're in the position that you just described, the latter position where they're just looking for bodies to to fill these vacant classrooms. And they, these are words coming out of their mouths. This is not me assuming or, uh, you know, making making even making educated guesses. These are this is what I hear from them um, often, way too often. Yeah. And, um, you know, and one of the responses that we're seeing <clears throat> what, that I've seen is, well, we're just going to lower the bar of entry into the profession as a response to this. We're just going to say, like, you know, hey, if you have a college degree, mm -hmm. you can. Hey, come on, let's 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 just plug you in somewhere. And I think um, there's something to be said for alternative certification programs. There's been a lot of great teachers um, that have come through uh, sure. PACE and, and some of these alternative certification programs. What I fear is if you continue to just lower the bar, lower the bar, one of the things that I, I don't know how you convince an 18 year old to get an education degree when, and pay, you know, go into debt or to pay however much money they're going to pay to get an education degree. When I can go and get a biology degree or a math degree or an English degree, and it essentially already counts as an education degree because let's say I get a biology degree. Well, I've got my, I've got my biology degree, but now I've also essentially got a teaching degree because I can just go do some kind of easy uh, alternative certification program and get plugged in. So there's no there's really no incentive for any young person to get in 
to get a, an education degree at this point. Like the, there's just none. I can't I can't imagine advising a young person to get an education degree unless they're just 100 percent sure that education is what they want to do with the rest of their lives. I see the value in it because you're learning things like Vygotsky, Piaget, you're learning all the educational psychology, you're doing a lot of important work there. I see the value in it, but it's hard from a very, from a pragmatic standpoint to say to an 18 year old, you know, to, to do that when you could essentially be getting two degrees by getting a different degree. And that's, that's what I fear is happening is we're undermining we're undermining what it means to be a teacher, undermining what it means to have a, a degree in education. We're, 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 we're sort of crumbling that. And that, that deprofessionalizes the whole like teaching field. It makes it feel like, well, anybody can, anybody can just kind of slide in and, and do this without a whole lot of training. And I, I, I think that's problematic moving forward in terms of the quality of educators. It's kind of like saying, well, you played basketball, so you can come over here and play football with us. All we got to do is put you through like a two week football training program. It's like, you know, maybe that's not the best way to build a football program. And I keep, I keep using that metaphor because I just think that it's, um, I think that's something people can relate to. Um, so Ernest says, poor working conditions, lack of respect, our problems, and then salaries matter. And I think that's true. You know, I, I was always, always argued that salaries to me weren't the biggest thing. But then when I thought about it, they kind of are. I mean, it's, it's huge because if I'm not making enough money and I have to go work a second job or a third job, now I'm, I'm going to be really, really stressed out. And I think that's what's happening with a lot of a lot of teachers having to work second and third jobs. So I think pay is huge. I think working conditions is huge. Um, and uh, it seems like a lot of the people watching agree. So what um, what does does Sarah make any recommendations based on this report? What's sort of like who, who, who sees this report and then kind of what's the follow up with this? I know you've probably had a million calls from. The yeah. press. But, um, yeah, I mean, we, we try to get it into as many hands as we can. Um, we share it, you know, share it with media. Um, we share it with um, education committees, you know, uh, oversight committees. Um, uh, we share it with, uh, you know, representatives that, that are on our board or not that we just work with, um, you know, EOC. I mean, teacher organizations like you um, and PSTA. So, I mean, it really anybody we... we think would appreciate it and and would want to know about it. And that was really, one, again, the main reason that we completely changed the format because, you know, it's, it's I think you can expect people to, to read something like that, you know, two pages of mostly visuals and some bullet points versus, you know, 12 pages of, of text and tables. So um, hopefully the, the people who need to be reading it are, are, are in fact reading it. Um, and we do, sorry, we do a, a, a good number of presentations as well, you know, following up, I'll, I'll typically get, you know, some, uh, you know, agencies, uh, groups, um, I usually do a, a presentation with the Education Oversight Committee, and, and, you know, we certainly want those folks um, looking at this very, very closely. Uh, so we, we do, we do share it a, a good bit in a, a, a fairly public way, I, I would say. Yeah, and it's always been interesting, you know, when I was on staff and doing the communications work, this was the thing that we released every year and it was like, you know, I mean, everybody's reporting on it and everybody's looking into these numbers. And, and so I'm sure that you've had a lot of interviews with, mm -hmm. you know, the t television and, and, and newspaper and that kind of thing. Um, what, um, just like, Thinking about as we move into next year, I, and, and this may be an impossible question for, for you to answer, but what what is your sense? What is your sense having followed these numbers now for what 14 years, 13, 14 years you've been following these yes. numbers? Yes. What is your sense as we move into then this next year? What is your sense of where these numbers are heading? I mean, I I haven't been wrong yet. So <laughs> When I when I think about you know the next year and you know if I think things are going to improve or or not um, I, I don't I don't see it getting any better you know unless you know unless some big changes come and some of the things that you you know mentioned um, have to be addressed or or teachers will keep leaving I mean I again I think that's just a fact I don't think that's an opinion I think that's yeah. I think that's just a, a very 
very educated guess on on the numbers that I see every year. Um, the reasons, again, we know that teachers are leaving, and I, you know, I don't, I don't know that it, it will change on on its own. And 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 here's here's the other thing that's that is a new, relatively new um, factor in this is now now we have this coordinated effort to demonize teachers as marxist woke indoctrinators so not only not only are they not being paid well and overworked um, and disrespected but now you've got this whole thing this whole public campaign where there's these false narratives being pushed uh, onto the public and and the profession instead of being re respected which you know used to be respected like my, my parents were taught taught I always it always seemed like, you know, that's a really, when I told people, you know, what my parents did, it was always like, oh, wow, that's really cool. Like, that was like a noble profession. Nobody was like accusing my mom or dad of trying to make their kids into Marxists. And, 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 and those of us in the profession know how absurd those remarks are, but we have more and more people buying into these narratives. And then, and then it's like, not only, not only am I being kind of crapped upon and not being paid well, but then then I have to go and I have to defend myself against all these charges that are just nonsense and, uh, and absurd. And, um, and it's, I, it feels like to me, and I think um, I had Dr. J.R. Green here on, on here, who's a superintendent from Fairfield, it feels to me like is, it, it is part of an overall intentional effort to dismantle and destroy public schools because the, 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 the number one thing, the number one thing, we, which this is an objective fact that you think you can agree on is we know that the number one factor in, in building a quality public school system is the quality of the public school of educators and the, the quality of the teachers that are leading classrooms. So if you bring in great people and, and fill those, those roles with great people, then, then the school system flourishes. So if they want to dismantle public education, what they have to do is make, make more and more good people leave and not entice anybody into it. And there, therefore you, that's one of the best ways you can attack it at its root by attacking the teaching profession and making an undermining it there. The problem with that is then what are we left with? So what we're left with is people coming in and saying that, well, now you can't trust your, the teachers at your public school, your public school is failing. So what's the alternative? Well, the alternative would be like, send your kid to a private school. Well, I can't afford that. Okay. So we'll, we'll come and swoop in and say, we're going to give you vouchers so that you can afford it. The problem with that, according to Dr. Green is that you, you, you give people vouchers, you give everybody a voucher, right? Everybody gets a $5,000 voucher to send their kid to a private school. But then what happens is law of supply and demand is, the private schools then can raise tuitions because now everybody's got this $5,000 coupon so I can raise my tuition rates. And then I raise my tuition rates and then this, the public option gets shut down and then eventually we can do, we can argue that we, we have to do away with these vouchers because we can't afford them anymore. And this is, this is to me as a person who's benefited, whose family has benefited from public schools um, is a personal uh, thing for me to protect the sanctity and the sacredness of our public education system because it's what provides people opportunity, what help, helps lift people out, out of poverty, it's what helps helps give people opportunity to, to advance their lives, to, to make something of their lives, to, 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 to reach higher. Uh, my mom was the first person to go to college in her family. Uh, my grandfather was uh, on, on my dad's side, the first person um, uh, in his family. And so um, I, I just, all of this is very upsetting. And I think we have a lot of people who are tuned in. Ernest, thank you for watching. And, um, and Colleen says, uh, uh, let's see, I'm not sure. She's, uh, she's, <laughs> she's saying, uh, commenting to, to Lynn's comment said, parents really have no clue. And I think this is, um, this is, it's incumbent upon us, I think, and I know you can't do it, Sarah, you're just, you're just releasing the numbers and these numbers are essential. And so thank you for the time that you put into doing this report, Jennifer, because I, I know that it's not a political agenda for you guys, but it's, the numbers are very, very important. Just like if you went to the doctor, all the numbers that you would get back from a, an objective test, whether it's cholesterol, your blood pressure, those are important numbers. And when we see these numbers 
continue to rise over the course of years, we just can't turn our backs on them. We cannot put our heads in the sand about this problem anymore. It is clear that we have a sustainable problem that's, get, that's getting worse every year. We can't keep teachers in the profession and we can't recruit them into the profession. And without that, we can't have a public education system that is worthy of the awesome students that we have across this state. So I just want to say thank you for because I, I know how much time you put into this report and how hard it is to get that data, to collect it, analyze it, double check it, triple check it, make sure that it's right. Uh, before we sign off, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about that's in the report or that's coming up, um, like, a, like an addendum to the report that's coming up in the next month or two? Um, the only thing I will say is that we – so all of the data tables, so, um, you know, all the questions that we ask the districts, um, all of that is on our website. So we have data tables for every question that we ask. Um, usually it's in the main report um, itself, but again, this year we did it very differently. So if you're interested in the actual, like, numbers, um, number, you know, of math teachers hired or, you know, that, that kind of thing, um, you can go to our website and there is a document there. And then the other thing, so I guess there's two things I want to say. Um, the other thing is we will be doing a sort of mid-year follow-up. Um, we started doing that about two years ago, just to sort of, just to sort of see where districts were. I mean, it's one thing to have, you know, almost 1500 vacancies at the beginning of the year. It's, you know, I think it's a, a, a very different story or, you know, a, a, a worse story, you know, a, a more um, significant story if they've got that many vacancies or more, as we saw last year, if they're reporting more in February, you know, four yeah. months later, um, you know, over halfway through the school year. And they still have these not just these vacancies, but <clears throat> they have more. And yeah. that's, what we, that's what we saw last year. So, <clears throat> excuse me. In February. Um, in February, yep. We'll, we'll do it again. We want to keep it on the same, you know, same timeline so we can really do some comparisons. But yeah, I, we'll see. We'll see what we find. Yeah. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much again. And thanks to everybody at Sarah. Sarah's doing, for those of you who aren't familiar with Sarah's work, you should go to sarah.org, that's C-E-R-R-A dot org. And you can see what Sarah has been working on because I don't know, without Sarah, these numbers would be, just, I mean, I can't imagine where these numbers would be. Think about it without protein, without teacher cadets, without our teaching fellows program that is recruiting the best and brightest into the, the profession, without our mentoring to help beginning teachers, without our teacher leadership programs to advance uh, those veteran uh, educators, without our, the support we do with national board and, and all the other things that, that Sarah's involved with in supporting this, the, the teacher pipeline, Without that, I can't. I just can't even imagine where these numbers would be. So, thanks to, to you and to everybody on the staff at Sierra for what you're doing. Thank you. All right, and we'll uh, we'll check back in with you in February and get some more data, <laughs> uh, more updates on this and 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 hope that it's getting better. But um, hard to imagine it will without without some serious efforts by our state leaders. So, all right, thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, Todd. I'll, I'll catch you in just a minute. All right, everybody, that was Dr. Jennifer Garrett. And again, if you want to read the report, just go to sarah.org. You can look uh, under the research tab for supply and demand. You can see this year's supply and demand report. You can also go back and look at um, previous years uh, of supply and demand reports and, and see that what we're talking about is just objective data. I mean, we have seen an increase in the number of teacher departures in the number of vacant classrooms and it's been going on for years and years and years and it's been getting worse and nothing's been done about it and it's getting worse and nothing's been done about it uh very very minimal efforts to for our uh, from our state leaders in terms of addressing this growing crisis and it is a crisis when you can't recruit teachers and you can't keep educators in classrooms in front of students that's a huge huge problem we wouldn't accept this from a football team. We shouldn't be accepting it for a public education system. The public education system is so much more important than USC or Clemson football. And we wouldn't, as fans of those football teams, like if, if Shane Beamer had like seven or eight positions on the team and he couldn't find a player to be on the team, and then he's having to go and get only like JUCO people to, to be on the, the team. 
and he was struggling and only getting like one and two star people to, to re- recruit and an occasional fours and fives. I mean, it's you can't build you couldn't build a football team that way. You couldn't be successful. You couldn't bring in. I mean, you could use try and use the transfer portal, but it's like you're not going to have a successful football team um, if you can't recruit. And you can't keep players because they're the players. Imagine if one in every seven players on USC or Clemson's team just quit and went to the transfer portal. I mean, you can't you can't sustain, you can't build any kind of program uh, that way. And our state leaders, they're kind of like our coaches. They're kind of like the 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 coaching staff, right, of our public education system. And they've been tasks tasked with um, providing the types of resources we need to build. A, a high quality public education system. And if they see this problem exists, it is an objective problem. This isn't like the SCEA's opinion. We have an objective problem here where we have a record number of vacant classrooms and record number of teacher departures, a decreasing number of people going into the profession. This is a problem. Leaders can no longer ignore this. It is their responsibility to fix it. And the SCEA and educators have been telling you how to fix it for years and you keep ignoring us. Stop ignoring us. We're telling you, here's how you can fix it. Here's how you can recruit teachers. Here's how you can retain teachers. You've got to increase their pay. The rate of inflation has gone up over 10%. You can't give them a 2% pay raise and expect them to take basically an 8% pay cut and stay in a profession where they're not respected and they're overworked and they're not getting any breaks. My son, my son waits tables at a pancake house. When I ask him how much he's making, he's making as much, if not more, than a first-year teacher would make if he, if he were to work there uh, at a, on a full-time basis giving pancakes to people. I would argue that educating the next generation of South Carolinians is more important than giving people pancakes. But he doesn't come, I need to, he's not stressed out. He goes into work, he checks in, he works, he checks out. He doesn't have papers to grade. He doesn't have to go home and prepare the pancakes for tomorrow. He just goes and he does his shift, he gets his money. And the problem is that educators are seeing this. They're seeing, hey, I can go, wait tables and I and I can go in and do my job and then I can go home and have time for my family and I can get paid just as much if not more I mean I did a, a piece where you look at Bucky's in Florence that just opened in Florence was paying twenty dollars an hour do the math if you work full-time at Bucky's and they've got benefits why would I mean people are going to it's not just about going to work it's also like to become a teacher going and get a four-year degree, I'm going to go spend money to get a four-year degree and the opportunity cost of not working for four years. And then and then I'm going to go and going to the teaching profession where I'm not going to make any more than I would have if I just started off at 18, just going to work at Bucky's without having to pay for college and have four years of earning money at a full-time job. There's It, w- it would take years and years and years to recoup the difference in that. I don't, you you cannot expect people to go into a profession where they're not paid well and they're not treated well. You've got to pay and treat teachers with the respect that they deserve. It is a noble profession. It's an important profession. And if, if it's important to educate young people, then you've got to attract great people in to lead those classrooms. It isn't rocket science. It really isn't. Increase pay. Give them more reasonable working conditions. And stop, for God's sakes, one of the things that every politician and public servant can do right now is stop demonizing educators and calling them woke indoctrinators or Marxists or whatever nonsense Tucker Carlson's come up with tonight. Stop. Stop doing that. Love teachers, show them respect, thank teachers, give them the gratitude they deserve. They're getting up and they're busting their butts every day. They're getting up early in the morning. They're going in and facing a very difficult job, but it's a very important job and they should be thanked for it. 
not demonized for it, not being falsely accused of things. It's it's not it's not hard. Treat people well, pay them well, and they'll they'll teach. People want to teach, and this is the thing: we don't have a teacher shortage. People have talked about this a lot. We don't have a teacher shortage. What we have is a shortage of people unwilling to do a job where they're not paid and they're not respected. That's what we have a shortage of. It's just so hard to blame people for that. Love them, pay them, treat them well. They'll, they'll, and, and this problem can be solved. It's not hard. So um, thanks to everybody watching tonight. President East, thank you for all of your questions and comments. They were wonderful. Tim Myers, thank you for, uh, for, for tuning in. Uh, Nat, uh, thank you. Uh, appreciate your comments. Um, uh, Wendy, Colleen, a lot of people watching tonight. Um, the, the website, again, Colleen, is sarah.org. That's C-E-R-R-A dot org. Um, and you can, they've, I mean, it's just such a wonderful um, organization uh, if you're not familiar with them. But if you don't have a teacher pro team or a teacher cadet site and your, your pro team is for middle school, if you don't have pro team at your middle school, look into that. If you don't have teacher cadet at your high school, definitely check into that as well. And I believe that the teaching fellows application, I think, is still open. So if you know somebody who's a senior who's interested in going into teaching, they should definitely know about the teaching fellows program is a wonderful, wonderful way for a young person to go through their, their college career um, and get, get special um, training on becoming a teacher and, and get it most, a lot of it paid for. So um, check out the teaching fellows program as well. Thanks again for everybody tuning in tonight. It's eight o'clock and I just do want to real quickly um, preview some things coming up. Um, uh, let me pull off this comment here real quick. Hold on. Um, so on the 28th of November, another member of the Sarah staff, um, Suzanne Cody, is going to be joining me talking about mentoring in the state of South Carolina. If you're interested in uh, becoming a, a mentor, a certified mentor in the state of South Carolina, you're going to definitely want to tune into that. She's going to talk about the importance of mentoring and Sarah's uh, mentor training that they developed um, it's going to be a really, really informative session on on mentoring. And then um, <clears throat> on December 1st, um, Yelena Popovich and I will be doing a session on mindfulness and school culture. So if you have any interest at all in mindfulness, uh, December 1st uh, at 7 o'clock, we're going to be doing a live stream on mindfulness and school culture. So I hope you'll join us for those. And as, as always, please, you can find all of these resources, including uh, the entire uh, live stream tonight, will be available within the next few days at cool.us, at cewl.us. So please, uh, please bookmark that website, explore all the resources there. And finally, if you are interested in having free professional learning at your school or in your district, you can reach out to me, toddshul at gmail.com. I will be more than happy to set something up for you. Um, we do uh, cool and the SCEA provides free professional learning in person or online for your staff. Uh, we do that as a complimentary service, and we'd love love to connect with you um, to to do that. So please don't um, don't hesitate to reach out. And then finally, if you're not a member of the SCEA, please consider joining at jointhescea.org. You can see at the bottom the, the URL, and, or you can text the word join to four eight seven four four. I want to thank again Dr. Jennifer Garrett and everybody at Sarah for um, for. Um, their support and for what they do. I thank uh, everybody who tuned in tonight and we'll see you on the next live stream. You guys have a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving week. I hope you all have to have time to take, take a break and enjoy your families and your friends. And uh, I'm going to say this. Bye everybody. <laughs>